Section 8 of The Two Paths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Todd Albrick. The Two Paths by John Ruskin. Section 8, Lecture 4. Influence of Imagination on Architecture. An address delivered to the members of the Architectural Association in Lyons Inn Hall, 1857. If we were to be asked abruptly, and required to answer briefly, what qualities chiefly distinguish great artists from feeble artists, we should answer, I suppose, first, their sensibility and tenderness, secondly, their imagination, and thirdly, their industry. Some of us might perhaps doubt the justice of attaching so much importance to this last character, because we have all known clever men who were indolent, and dull men who were industrious. But though you may have known clever men who were indolent, you never knew a great man who was so, and during such investigation as I have been able to give to the lives of the artists whose works are in all points noblest, no fact ever looms so large upon me, no law remains so steadfast in the universality of its application, as the fact and law that they are all great workers. Nothing concerning them is a matter of more astonishment than the quantity they have accomplished in the given length of their life. And when I hear a young man spoken of as giving promise of high genius, the first question I ask about him is always, does he work? But though this quality of industry is essential to an artist, it does not in any wise make an artist. Many people are busy whose doings are little worth. Neither does sensibility make an artist, since, as I hope, many can feel both strongly and nobly, who yet care nothing about art. But the gifts which distinctly mark the artist, without which he must be feeble in life, forgotten in death, with which he may become one of the shakers of the earth, and one of the signal lights in heaven, are those of sympathy and imagination. I will not occupy your time, nor incur the risk of your dissent, by endeavouring to give any close definition of this last word. We all have a general and sufficient idea of imagination, and of its work with our hands and in our hearts. We understand it, I suppose, as the imaging or picturing of new things in our thoughts. And we always show an involuntary respect for this power, wherever we can recognize it, acknowledging it to be a greater power than manipulation, or calculation, or observation, or any other human faculty. If we see an old woman spinning at the fireside, and distributing her thread dexterously from the distaff, we respect her for her manipulation. If we ask her how much she expects to make in a year, and she answers quickly, we respect her for her calculation. If she is watching at the same time that none of her grandchildren fall into the fire, we respect her for her observation. Yet for all this, she may still be a commonplace old woman enough. But if she is all the time telling her grandchildren a fairy tale out of her head, we praise her for her imagination, and say she must be a rather remarkable old woman. Precisely in like manner, if an architect does his working drawing well, we praise him for his manipulation. If he keeps closely within his contract, we praise him for his honest arithmetic. If he looks well to the laying of his beams, so that nobody shall drop through the floor, we praise him for his observation. But he must, somehow, tell us a fairy tale out of his head beside all this, else we cannot praise him for his imagination, nor speak of him as we did of the old woman, as being in any wise out of the common way a rather remarkable architect. It seemed to me, therefore, as if it might interest you to-night, if we were to consider together what fairy tales are in and by architecture to be told, what there is for you to do in this severe art of yours out of your heads, as well as by your hands. Perhaps the first idea which a young architect is apt to be allured by, as a head problem in these experimental days, 
is its being incumbent upon him to invent a new style worthy of modern civilization in general and of england in particular a style worthy of our engines and telegraphs as expansive as steam and as sparkling as electricity but if there are any of my hearers who have been impressed with this sense of inventive duty may i ask them first whether their plan is that every inventive architect among us shall invent a new style for himself and have a county set aside for his conceptions or a province for his practice or must every architect invent a little piece of the new style and all put it together at last like a dissected map and if so when the new style is invented what is to be done next i will grant you this el dorado of imagination but can you have more than one columbus or if you sail in company and divide the prize of your discovery and the honour thereof who is to come after you clustered columbuses to what fortunate islands of style are your architectural descendants to sail avaricious of new lands when our desired style is invented will not the best we can all do be simply to build in it and can not you now do that in styles that are known observe i grant for the sake of your argument what perhaps many of you know that i would not grant otherwise that a new style can be invented i grant you not only this but that it shall be wholly different from any that was ever practised before we will suppose that capitals are to be at the bottom of pillars instead of the top and that buttresses shall be on the tops of pinnacles instead of at the bottom that you roof your apertures with stones which shall neither be arched nor horizontal and that you compose your decoration of lines which shall neither be crooked nor straight the furnace and the forge shall be at your service you shall draw out your plates of glass and beat out your bars of iron till you have encompassed us all if your style is of the practical kind with endless perspective of black skeleton and blinding square or if your style is to be of the ideal kind you shall wreathe your streets with ductile leafage and roof them with variegated crystal you shall put if you will all london under one blazing dome of many colours that shall light the clouds round it with its flashing as far as to the sea and still i ask you what after this do you suppose those imaginations of yours will ever lie down there asleep beneath the shade of your iron leafage or within the coloured light of your enchanted dome not so those souls and fancies and ambitions of yours are wholly infinite and whatever may be done by others you will still want to do something for yourselves if you cannot rest content with palladio neither will you with paxton all the metal and glass that ever were melted have not so much weight in them as will clog the wings of one human spirit's aspiration if you will think over this quietly by yourselves and can get the noise out of your ears of the perpetual empty idle incomparably idiotic talk about the necessity of some novelty in architecture you will soon see that the very essence of a style properly so called is that it should be practised for ages and applied to all purposes and that so long as any given style is in practice all that is left for individual imagination to accomplish must be within the scope of that style not in the invention of a new one if there are any here therefore who hope to obtain celebrity by the invention of some strange way of building which must convince all europe into its adoption to them for the moment i must not be understood to address myself but only to those who would be content with that degree of celebrity which an artist may enjoy who works in the manner of his forefathers which the builder of salisbury cathedral might enjoy in england though he did not invent gothic and which titian might enjoy at venice though he did not invent oil painting addressing myself then to those humbler but wiser or rather only wise students who are content to avail themselves of some system of building already understood let us consider together what room for the exercise of the imagination may be left to us under such conditions and first i suppose it will be said or thought that the architect's principal field for exercise of his invention must be in the disposition of lines mouldings and masses in agreeable proportions indeed if you adopt some styles of architecture you cannot exercise invention in any other way 
and I admit that it requires genius and special gift to do this rightly. Not by rule nor by study can the gift of graceful proportionate design be obtained. Only by the intuition of genius can so much as a single tier of façade be beautifully arranged. And the man has just cause for pride, as far as our gifts can ever be a cause for pride, who finds himself able, in a design of his own, to rival even the simplest arrangement of parts in one by San Michele, Inigo Jones, or Christopher Wren. Invention, then, and genius being granted as necessary to accomplish this, let me ask you, what, after all, with this special gift and genius, you have accomplished, when you have arranged the lines of a building beautifully? In the first place you will not, I think, tell me that the beauty there attained is of a touching or pathetic kind. A well-disposed group of notes in music will make you sometimes weep and sometimes laugh. You can express the depth of all affections by those dispositions of sound. You can give courage to the soldier, language to the lover, consolation to the mourner, more joy to the joyful, more humility to the devout. Can you do as much by your group of lines? Do you suppose the front of Whitehall, a singularly beautiful one, ever inspires the two horse guards during the hour they sit opposite to it with military ardour? Do you think that the lovers in our London walk down to the front of Whitehall for consolation when mistresses are unkind? Or that any person wavering in duty or feeble in faith was ever confirmed in purpose or in creed by the pathetic appeal of those harmonious architraves? You will not say so. Then if they cannot touch, or inspire, or comfort any one, can your architectural proportions amuse any one? Christmas is just over. You have doubtless been at many merry parties during the period. Can you remember any in which architectural proportions contributed to the entertainment of the evening? Proportions of notes in music were, I am sure, essential to your amusement. The setting of flowers in hair and of ribbons on dresses were also subjects of frequent admiration with you, not inessential to your happiness. Among the juvenile members of your society, the proportion of currants in cake and of sugar in comfits became subjects of acute interest. And when such proportions were harmonious, motives also of gratitude to cook and to confectioner. But did you ever see either young or old amused by the architrave of the door, or otherwise interested in the proportions of the room than as they admitted more or fewer friendly faces? Nay, if all the amusement that there is in the best proportional architecture of London could be concentrated into one evening, and you were to issue tickets for nothing to this great proportional entertainment, how do you think it would stand between you and the Drury pantomime? You are then, remember, granted to be people of genius, great and admirable, and you devote your lives to your art. But you admit that you cannot comfort anybody, you cannot encourage anybody, you cannot improve anybody, and you cannot amuse anybody. I proceed then farther to ask, can you inform anybody? Many sciences cannot be considered as highly touching or emotional. Nay, perhaps not specially amusing, Scientific men may sometimes, in these respects, stand on the same ground with you. As far as we can judge by the results of the late war, science helps our soldiers about as much as the front of Whitehall. And at the Christmas parties, the children wanted no geologists to tell them about the behavior of bears and dragons in Queen Elizabeth's time. Still, your man of science teaches you something. He may be dull at a party or helpless in a battle, he is not always that, but he can give you, at all events, knowledge of noble facts, and open to you the secrets of the earth and air. Will your architectural proportions do as much? Your genius is granted, and your life is given, and what do you teach us? Nothing, I believe, from one end of that life to the other, but that two and two make four, and that one is to two as three is to six. You cannot, then, it is admitted, comfort any one, serve or amuse any one, nor teach any one. Finally, I ask, can you be of use to any one? Yes, you reply, certainly we are of some use, we architects, in a climate like this where it always rains. 
you are of use certainly but pardon me only as builders not as proportionalists we are not talking of building as a protection but only of that special work which your genius is to do not of building substantial and comfortable houses like mr cubitt but of putting beautiful facades on them like inigo jones and again i ask are you of use to any one will your proportions of the facade heal the sick or clothe the naked supposing you devoted your lives to be merchants you might reflect at the close of them how many fainting for want you had brought corn to sustain how many infected with disease you had brought balms to heal how widely among multitudes of faraway nations you had scattered the first seeds of national power and guided the first rays of sacred light had you been in fine anything else in the world but architectural designers you might have been of some use or good to people content to be petty tradesmen you would have saved the time of mankind rough-handed daily labourers you would have added to their stock of food or of clothing but being men of genius and devoting your lives to the exquisite exposition of this genius on what achievements do you think the memories of your old age are to fasten whose gratitude will surround you with its glow or on what accomplished good of that greatest kind for which men show no gratitude will your life rest the contentment of its close truly i fear that the ghost of proportionate lines will be thin phantoms at your bedsides very speechless to you and that on all the emanations of your high genius you will look back with less delight than you might have done on a cup of cold water given to him who was thirsty or to a single moment when you had prevented with your bread him that fled do not answer nor think to answer that with your great works and great payments of workmen in them you would do this i know you would and will as builders but i repeat it is not your building that i am talking about but your brains it is your invention and imagination of whose profit i am speaking the good done through the building observe is done by your employers not by you you share in the benefit of it the good that you personally must do is by your designing and i compare you with musicians who do good by their pathetic composing not as they do good by employing fiddlers in the orchestra for it is the public who in reality do that not the musicians so clearly keeping to this one question what good we architects are to do by our genius and having found that on our proportionate system we can do no good to others will you tell me lastly what good we can do to ourselves observe nearly every other liberal art or profession has some intense pleasure connected with it irrespective of any good to others as lawyers or physicians or clergymen you would have the pleasure of investigation and of historical reading as part of your work as men of science you would be rejoicing in curiosity perpetually gratified respecting the laws and facts of nature as artists you would have delight in watching the external forms of nature as day labourers or petty tradesmen supposing you to undertake such work with as much intellect as you are going to devote to your designing you would find continued subjects of interest in the manufacture or the agriculture which you helped to improve or in the problems of commerce which bore on your business but your architectural designing leads you into no pleasant journeys into no seeing of lovely things no discerning of just laws no warmths of compassion no humilities of veneration no progressive state of sight or soul our conclusion is must be that you will not amuse nor inform nor help anybody you will not amuse nor better nor inform yourselves you will sink into a state in which you can neither show nor feel nor see anything but that one is to two as three is to six and in that state what should we call ourselves men i think not the right name for us would be numerators and denominators vulgar fractions shall we then abandon this theory of the soul of architecture being in proportional lines and look whether we can find anything better to exert our fancies upon may we not to begin with accept this great principle 
that as our bodies to be in health must be generally exercised, so our minds to be in health must be generally cultivated. You would not call a man healthy who had strong arms but was paralytic in his feet, nor one who could walk well but had no use of his hands, nor one who could see well if he could not hear. You would not voluntarily reduce your bodies to any such partially developed state. Much more, then, you would not, if you could help it, reduce your minds to it. Now, your minds are endowed with a vast number of gifts of totally different uses, limbs of mind, as it were, which, if you don't exercise, you cripple. One is curiosity. That is a gift, a capacity of pleasure in knowing, which, if you destroy, you make yourselves cold and dull. Another is sympathy, the power of sharing in the feelings of living creatures, which, if you destroy, you make yourselves hard and cruel. Another of your limbs of mind is admiration, the power of enjoying beauty or ingenuity, which, if you destroy, you make yourselves base and irreverent. Another is wit, or the power of playing with the lights of the many sides of truth, which, if you destroy, you make yourselves gloomy and less useful in cheering to others than you might be. So that in choosing your way of work it should be your aim, as far as possible, to bring out all these faculties as far as they exist in you, not one merely, nor another, but all of them. And the way to bring them out is simply to concern yourselves attentively with the subjects of each faculty. To cultivate sympathy you must be among living creatures, and thinking about them, and to cultivate admiration you must be among beautiful things and looking at them. All this sounds much like truism, at least I hope it does, for then you will surely not refuse to act upon it and to consider farther how, as architects, you are to keep yourselves in contemplation of living creatures and lovely things. End of section 8 Recording by Todd Albrick